Are we back and ready? We're back and Anybody ready. hungry? Anybody thirsty? Yeah. Yes. I am. And I pray I stay that way, never satisfied. Amen. Amen. Luke chapter 21. Verse 33 says, The heaven and the earth shall pass away, but my words shall by no means pass away. And take heed to yourselves. Turn to your neighbor today and say, Take heed to yourselves. Take heed to yourself. Have you ever taken heed of yourself? Mm. What does that mean? It means deal with your heart. Come on. Because what's coming and what is here is going to deal with our heart. Yes. And if we let God deal with it ahead of time, we will get through. Amen? Yeah. So take heed to yourselves. Deal with your heart. Lest your hearts be weighed down by gluttony. What does that mean? Overindulgence in the world. You're so busy with things in the world and so drunk by things of the world that you are oblivious to what's going on in the generation and what God is doing in the world that we live in. We don't want to live like that. Amen? Amen. We live in a generation who's weighed down with gluttony, overindulgence of the world, and it's hard. I have to pull myself out of the world and ask God, give me hunger. Let me thirst for you. Draw me to the word. Draw me to prayer. Draw me to your presence. And he will. If we ask him to draw us, he will draw us. Amen? Amen. And drunkenness. That's not just speaking about having too many buds. It's talking about being inebriated, that you cannot pick up what the Spirit of Jehovah is saying to this generation. Don't be so inebriated by the world, so engrossed into fantasy football, so engrossed into political debates, so engrossed into kingdoms and principles of this world that are passing away and coming to nothing and that are not a part of God's kingdom. Take heed to yourself. Let your hearts be weighed down by gluttony and drunkenness and worries of this life. If you've worried this week, let me see your hand. I have. I've been tempted to worry. Not only are we preaching in the last generation, we're building an ark in the last generation from scratch. We didn't have a blueprint of go for wood. And so we're seeking the Father step by step and there's things that come up and I'm a human being and there's things I want to worry about. In fact, I was reminded today during worship when we were just singing that song, I trust in you, I trust in you, you're my hope, you're my song, you're my fortress. Wednesday night in waiting prayer, Yeshua came and he just took my hands and he held my hands and he got down and he just looked at me face to face and just said, look in my eyes, look in my eyes. And when I did, I just saw those fiery eyes. But what was so prevalent to me Wednesday night was the nail pierced hands that he was holding my hands with. And he was saying over and over and over again, you can trust me. You can trust me. You can trust me. We can trust him. He is trustworthy. He is. We don't have to worry. We can trust. And you can't do both at the same time. No, don't be burdened down with the worries of this life for that day if you are like this if you're weighed down with gluttony overindulgence in the world inebriated and unsensitive if that's the right word which it's not but deal with it with the things of God and what he's saying and doing in our generation when we're bogged down with the worries of life what's going to happen here what's going to happen here should I do this should I do that what's going to happen the end of this verse and that day his return come on you suddenly say suddenly <laughs> for it shall come as a snare on a few countries on a few people over here. No, it shall come as a snare, like a bear trap. Pop, on those dwelling on the face of all the earth. All. So what are we to do? Verse 36. This is what I want us to pray as we start today. Everybody say watch. watch. This is not a Timex advertisement. This is talking about being alert to what's happening in the world. Could you take a pencil and a piece of paper today and write down signs that the prophets in Yeshua told us to be watching for? Could you make a list? And if you could make a list, are you watching for those things on that list? Or are we inebriated, busy with this world... 
and delusional to what's really happening around us. How can you watch? How can I watch if we don't know what to watch for? Go watch for the delivery truck coming so we don't miss them. Okay, you could do that. But what if I just said, hey, free to go watch? Uh, okay. Mm, what do I watch for? Frida, go watch. Uh, okay. What do I watch for? Frida, go. We have to know what to watch for. How do we know? We read the prophets. We cannot understand eschatology or end time doctrine if we don't know the prophets because the prophets interpret the book of Revelation. It's the foundation. You have to have the keys. So when Yeshua says, watch, what are we to be watching for? I encourage you, take that to prayer this week. What, are, what should I be watching for? If you're not watching for the delivery truck, you might miss him. And it might come on you suddenly. Watch then at all times. How often? All times. Oh, I've heard Yeshua's coming back time and time again. I've just heard 1974, 1983, whatever it was. He's coming, he's coming, he's coming. I'm just so tired of all this watch and pray. Let's just live life, live in the world. And just like when he shows up, he shows up. Is that what this scripture teaches? Yeshua himself? No. He says, don't be focused on the world. Don't be bogged down with the world. Don't be carrying the world. But come out of that system and be alert. Be sober and watch at all times, even in our generation. We are to be watching at all times and what? Pray. There's only one thing less attended in an assembly than a prayer meeting, and that's an evangelical outreach. Mm -hmm. You have a prayer meeting, it's interesting. Where did everybody go? And you have an evangelical outreach. Ah, everybody runs for the bushes. Everybody say, Susan, don't tell the truth. Watch then at all times and pray that you, this is real personal, that you be counted worthy. Now this is Yeshua talking to us. He was talking to those following him there. Are we following him today? So he's talking to us. Pray that you be worthy to escape. Everybody say escape. You need to go through the prophets and write down the passages that talk about the ones who escape. It's there and it tells you who you are if you're the one who is a part of that group. And I'm not talking about hit the rapture button and get out of it. I'm talking about being hidden and clothed during a time of the day of Jehovah. There's an escaping from that judgment and wrath that you're going to be protected from if you were counted worthy. Can you see? There is a qualification. It's not, woohoo, I just got it. I'm telling you, we best be careful and work out our deliverance with fear and trembling lest we think we stand when we fall. Israel missed it because they got cocky. We got the covenant. We got the promises. We got the Torah. We got this. Then they also decided to get Baal. And then they decided to get the queen of heaven. Then they decided to mix it up and have the pagan holidays with God's holidays and call it all worshiping God and come together. They got cocky. We're God's people. What God do? Judged him, kicked him out of the land. Why do we think, the apostles say, that we would be any different? Oh, give us the spirit of the fear of Jehovah and a carefree, drunken generation, as in the days of Noah, eating and drinking and going and giving in marriage, when suddenly, unexpectedly, as a thief in the night, which is a Hebrew idiom that was used for the high priest who would go into the temple at night, and there was a priest that was on duty to, to guard the menorah and to keep the lamp burning. And he was called a thief in the night because he would unexpectedly, undetermined and out of schedule show up one night. And if the priest who was in the temple, who was to keep the flame burning in the menorah had fallen asleep, he would take the flame and set his garment on fire and he would run out naked in the streets ashamed. Why do you think it says in the book of Revelation, do not be found naked without the garment for the wedding. 
when he returns. He's coming like that high priest who unexpectedly comes to the temple and sees, are you awake? Are you guarding the flame? Are you on fire? Are you ready in season and out of season? Or are you deluded by the world, too busy picking out your cable channels? I have to fan my own flame. You have to fan your own flame. Amen. That's right. Because you have to be found worthy. I can't qualify for you, and you can't qualify for me. Watch then at all times and pray that you be counted worthy to escape all this about to take place and to stand before the Son of Man. Yeshua, we pray today for the spirit of wisdom. We pray for the spirit of revelation. We pray that the eyes of our understanding would be enlightened, that we would know the hope to which we have been called, that we would know the glorious inheritance that is in the set apart ones for Yeshua, and that we would know the power that is at work within us that is like the power who raised Yeshua, our master, from the dead. And I pray that we would be found watching at all times and we would be found praying that we would be worthy to escape what is going to come upon this earth as a trap suddenly upon all those on this earth. And that we would be able to be those who've been called to stand unashamedly in that hour before the Son of Man because we have kept your commandments and we have guarded the witness of the testimony of Yeshua, the Son of God who came in the flesh the only way to the Father, the creator of all. Burn in our hearts today, Father, that we may not just read about the lampstands of which we are, but we would be the lampstands. Father, we thank you for it. In Yeshua's name, everybody said amen. amen. Woo, everybody say burn. Burn. This is lesson six in the re in the series of the revelation of the two lampstands. Lesson six. So if you're just picking up, we're building on a lot of foundation. I would encourage you to go to YouTube. It's free. You can listen to the first five lessons if you're hungry and thirsty. But if you've been listening and tracking with us this time, you should know what this equation means. It means that we are to be witnesses. To be a witness means that we are to be a light. And to be a light is the imagery used throughout scripture as the lampstand or the menorah. And we've been talking about how this is and was in the Torah, the mission statement for Israel, how we it is and was the mission statement for Israel today as Yeshua said in Matthew 5 that you're to be a city on a hill that was not a new idea that was building on the purpose that Israel was set apart as a treasured possession given the right rulings of Yehovah to draw all nations to him it is and it is now the purpose of Israel God's set apart nation. So we've been looking at what it means to be a witness. We're here in the last generation to be a witness. I want to say that again. We're here. Why am I here? The question we all ask. Let me answer it for you today. According to scripture, you are here to be a witness. 
What does that mean? Witness about what God has done in your life. Witness about the revelation in the scripture that God has given you. To be a witness of the testimony, how he brought you out of darkness into his glorious light that we can shine for him. To be a witness of what he says to you, which means we have to learn to hear his voice. My sheep know my voice. What did he say to you this week? What encounters did you have with him this week? Did you seek him this week? If you say no, don't be condemned. Don't kick yourself in the tail on the way out the door. Ask God for the grace to seek him this week. Because there's time. There's still time. Amen? Amen. So we are to be witnesses. That means to be a light and that comes into this imagery of the lampstands that we've been building into uh, Revelation as we head today to Revelation chapter 6. So on your notes, we're actually starting on page 2 on letter B, midway down the page. It's kind of where we stopped last week after I shared um, the vision of the glory dome covering and a place of escape for those in the future. In fact, that passage in Isaiah 4 that talks about that talks about those escaped ones that come to uh, the places where he has said his name during the days ahead. We don't have time to unpack that, but it's awesome. Our future is bright. Hallelujah. All right. Not so for the wicked, but our future is bright if we're on fire. Okay. Here we go. Letter B. Building on this foundation of the assemblies. Now, when I say assemblies, I'm using that instead of what was inserted by King James, a politician through scribes who if they didn't obey would have their head cut off in the Bible calling God's people church. And church is a pagan word that goes back to a goddess who, whose father was the son, whose mother was a mermaid. And she turned men into pigs. She was a sorceress known as Circe. Now, you can believe or not believe it, but I do not want to call God's people a sorceress because I know that people who participate in sorcery do not inherit the kingdom of heaven. If you believe the scripture, you know that. I am not going to call God's people a sorceress, and neither is Mark. And so we went back to the original of what God called his people, ecclesia means called out. Nobody say called out. Called out of what? Called out of Babylon. Abraham was the first who was called out. He is our father according to Paul. And as we follow in those footsteps of our forefathers, we also are being called out of Babel. And as we're called out, that's the ecclesia, that is the assembled ones or the called out ones. So as we read through Revelation, I will not be referring to the churches. I will be referring to the assemblies, the true ecclesia set apart, called out ones. Father, take a coal and cleanse our lips. Building on this foundation of the assemblies being the lampstands that was defined by our master Yeshua himself. And we read that last week in um, Revelation chapter 1 where you have this imagery of Yeshua burning eyes, white hair as wool, his feet burnished as bronze. He has seven stars in his hand in the midst of seven lampstands and he himself makes it easy for us. He says, the seven lampstands are the seven assemblies. Can I hear a yay and amen? So we don't even have to guess at this one, okay? The seven assemblies. What we have to do is take that biblical definition and take it all the way through the book of Revelation. Because as we do, then as it's been scripturally defined, we find the meaning of what God is talking about. Especially as we get into chapter 11 today. So because some of you weren't here, I just wanted to qualify that. So I'm going to read that again. Letter B. Building on this foundation of the assemblies, being the lampstands that was defined by our master Yeshua himself in Revelation 1, let us take this revelation, unlocking this imagery of the lampstand, and apply it to another portion of Yeshua's revelation to John. 
Now, what we're going to do today, if you'll turn in your scriptures or they will put them up for you, to Revelation chapter 11, and I will be reading from the scriptures translation, the Institute for Scripture Research. Um, Revelation chapter 11 is the, the chapter that we're going to begin to look at and we've been building into with these first five lessons. In chapter 11 here on your notes, we find the passage of the two olive trees and the two lampstands. Everybody say two olive trees. I have a picture that I drew of this portion in Zechariah. I may get it out next week. I think I drew that too big. Two olive trees. Everybody say and. And. And two lampstands. Now, why am I making a point to visualize this for you? Two olive trees and two lampstands. Okay, read your next paragraph, if you will. We have all probably heard this passage taught from the aspect of the two witnesses. Yes? How many of you have always heard? I have as well. Chapter 11 of Revelation talking about the two witnesses, okay? As being the two prophetic witnesses who will return and have a supernatural witness to the nations of 42 months or during the day of Yehovah. Again, I'm using the term the day of Yehovah because that is what the prophets called it. Joel was the first one to use the term in the written prophets, even though he's not the first prophet. And throughout the prophets, when you see on that day or the day of Yehovah. He's talking about the day when the wrath of God is poured out on the earth and the sinners who have chucked his covenant, chucked his Torah, said, you're not the creator. I don't believe you. I'm going to do my own thing. And as creator, as judge, he has the right to come back and set the record straight. And I don't refer to it as the great, the tribulation and the great tribulation that's used one time in in Matthew 24, Yeshua said, in the time of distress or the time of the great tribulation, it is over and over and over again in our scripture called the day of Yehovah. And it's important, listen, if we do not want to be deceived in the days ahead, that we begin to call things what the scripture calls things. Because if man gives something a term, man then defines the term for you. Thereby giving way to deception in our belief system. But if we allow the scripture to define, to give us the terms and the scripture to define what those terms are, there is less of a possibility with the wonderful Ruach who lives within us to be deceived and led astray. Because it is the most repeated phrase of the generation at the end of the age, do not let anyone lead you astray. It is important to have safeguards in our life of how can we not be led astray. Number one, use scripture terms. Ask the Holy Spirit to begin to take terms out of your mouth that man put there. Number two, be connected to an assembly who was awake or at least awakening, watching and praying and seeking the Father and His will during these days. Those are two topics. Okay, that we all need in our life. So we have all probably heard this passage taught from the aspect of the two witnesses as being the two prophetic witnesses who will return and have a supernatural witness to the nations of 42 months during the day of Jehovah. This is no doubt described in this passage. I am not discounting that. This is no doubt described in this passage, but, everybody say, give me a but. But this is not all that is described in this passage. 
This is not something that I pulled out of a book. This is not something that I heard Perry Stone teach in Gatlinburg. I have been meditating on this scripture for four to five years. The Holy Spirit has been drawing me to this passage. I did not know why. I just knew he was. And I don't know how you see God, but I just love to ask him questions because he loves to answer them. But he requires patience and waiting upon on him a lot and literally for four to five years I've been going to him with this passage and the one preceding it I love about the seven thunders and John and I'd love to talk about what I think about John today but we can't do that in chapter 11 you have these two witnesses that are going to have a mighty ministry in the earth but there's more than the two prophetic ones and we've all heard um, you know the debate so it's Elijah and Moses because of the signs no it's Enoch and Elijah. I would say go with the ones who didn't physically die because these guys are going to be killed and it's hard to kill someone twice. But I will tell you this, the book of Revelation is called Revelation on purpose because if you are the set apart ones, as we walk toward it, it begins to be revealed. And so there's certain things that as we are in this generation right now, there's the G20 or summit that's going over in Japan. One of the main topics that they're researching and talking about all of these national leaders is called global data governance. Again, the head guy throwing it in Japan said this is one of their number one focuses for this summit. In case you missed it, I'll say it again. Global data governance. Give me a hmm. I personally believe the B system that is rising in the earth now is a global data governance. That's why Daniel in, the, in his prophetic book said the last beast that arises is unlike any beast that has been before it. Because it's not just a man in a kingdom. But we don't have time to talk about that today. So I believe there are these two prophets of old who have not died, who have been taken and kept by God for these 40 and two months, the day of Jehovah, that are going to come back and give the B system the what for. Can I hear an amen? amen? I mean, if you don't like their preaching, they just burn you up right there. Crispy critter. You know what I'm saying? Fire comes out of their mouth. I mean, if you don't like them, you leave with no eyebrows. You know what I'm saying? You're going to pay attention to these people. But when it gets to this point of the end of the age, okay, you've got the wrath of God in part. But I believe the trumpet judgments being poured out on the earth in the meantime, while these prophets are prophesying and declaring the truth of God, but they are so hardened in their heart at that time that they won't repent. I mean, the earth is birthing the millennial reign. The wrath of God is being displayed. But I, I, I am proud of who I am. I am proud of what I do. And I am proud, proud, proud. proud, proud. And that's all I'll say about that. The Bible says, humble yourself. And we best be humbling ourselves because it's not too good about what happens to the proud in the scripture. So we have here these prophets that are ministering for God in the earth as his witnesses. I believe that these are the two olive trees. And we will go into Zechariah and look at the prophecy concerning these olive trees and the ministry that they will have. And I believe that these two olive trees minister to the two lampstands that are in the earth at that time. How do you get to the two lampstands? Well, fasten your seatbelts and we will get there. Again, I was having my quiet time two months ago in a recliner, in our bedroom, one morning, and again, I was drawn to Revelation 11. And I'm like, really? So I'm going back there, and I'm reading, and all of a sudden, click, 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 and I'm like, no way. And then the last thing is, really? And I go there, and I draw out the chart, and it worked. 
what did I just tell you? You probably have no idea, but I'm just the type of person that likes to keep the little secret and then blow the confetti, boom, and let you know. So we'll get there, okay? But right now, we're still building into the confetti moment, okay? What we want to do today is expand our understanding that, yes, this is talking about the two olive trees, but there's also two lampstands. Now, here's a big key. If we keep what Yeshua said is the lampstands and apply it to the two lampstands, who are they? Two what? Two assemblies. Give me a hmm. So you have this prophetic office ministering to the two burning lampstands in the earth during this time. Oh, it's going to be glorious. It's going to be glorious. Notice in your notes, there are two lampstands and two olive trees. What is two plus two? Four. Please help me. It's four. I'm even not that great at math, but I know that that makes four, not two. All right? Could this be speaking of two different types of Time, witnesses? I believe this is. There's two different types of witnesses going on during this time. And I believe when we get to the end of this, you'll believe that if you have ears to hear. Here we go. Revelation 11. Let's read 1 through 4. I'm tempted to read the whole thing today, but we're going to try to just do that and see what happens. All right. Revelation 11, 1 through 4. This is John writing, and he just has been told he is to prophesy again, and it starts with an and, but we don't have time to back up. And a reed like a measuring rod was given to me, that's John, and the mes messenger or angel stood saying, rise and measure the dwelling place of Elohim. If I say and, and. the slaughter place, if I say and, and, those worshiping in it. But cast out the court which is outside the dwelling place. Now, this translation uses that for temple because temple has pagan origins. Baal has a temple. You know what I'm saying? But cast out the court which is outside the dwelling place and do not measure it, for it has been given to the nations, and they shall trample the set apart city underfoot for 42 months. There's a time key for us. Verse 3 And I shall give unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy 1,260 days clad in sackcloth. You should know what does sackcloth represent? Yeah. Repentance. Somebody say repentance. repentance. That's a key that we're going to tie in and identifying who these two lampstands are. Verse 4, And these are the two olive trees, if I say and, and, the two lampstands that are standing before the Elohim or God of the earth. And then he goes on and talks about what I would define as the two olive trees and their ministry during this time who will work uh, with the two lampstands being the two assemblies that will be witnessing for God also during this time. Now, on the bottom of the page there in two, here's the revelation meditation that we need to have here. Notice again, there are two olive trees and two lampstands. That's four witnesses, two categories of witnesses. Page three. The two olive trees are a reference to the finishing of the temple in Zechariah 4. We will go to Zechariah 4 sometime. We will not today. And of the, of the two prophets chosen for this time and their ministry to the assemblies, this carries important revelation for us who are a part of the assemblies, okay? They will be ministering for God in the earth, but they will also be ministering to the lampstands. Okay, I got a Holy Spirit nudge. So let's go to Zechariah 4. I'm wanting to get probably farther than I should today. And let's read Zechariah 4. We're just going to try to do it. Cursory reading here. We'll see how we can do. Zechariah chapter 4 is the prophetic vision given to Zechariah concerning the restoration of the kingship of God in the earth. Uh, chapter 3 is the restoration of the priesthood. 
So we have priests and kings at the end of time, at the end of this age. So let's look. Chapter 4 of Zechariah, verse 1. And the messenger who was speaking to me came back and woke me up as a man is awakened from what? Sleep. Sounds like Matthew 25 to me. Wise virgins. Verse 2. And he said to me, what do you see? So I said, I have looked and I see a lampstand of gold with a bowl on top of it. Mark, would you go get the picture in the office, please, of the olive trees and the lampstand on the wall? The, the painting. It's behind the refrigerator in there, hanging on the wall. Yeah, thank you. Verse 2, and he said to me, what do you see? So I said, I have looked and see a lampstand of gold with a bowl on top of it. And on the stand, seven lamps with seven spouts to the seven lamps. And the two olive trees are by it, one at the right of the bowl and the other at its left. So what do we have? We have two olive trees and from these olive trees are coming seven golden shoots that give oil to the lampstands that allow them to burn. They fuel them and minister to them. Can you see that? Okay. Verse 4. Then I responded and spoke to the messenger who was speaking to me saying, What are these, my master? Ask questions. Best thing in the kingdom, ask questions. Verse 5. And the messenger who was speaking to me answered and said to me, Do you not know what these are? And I said, No, my master. And he answered and said to me, This is the word of Jehovah to Zerubbabel, or Zerubbabel. Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, said Jehovah of hosts. Now this passage is about the fulfilling and the rebuilding of the second temple. But as a lot of the prophecies in Scripture are dual fulfillment. So, the temple of Jehovah, being his assembly in the earth right now, is being built, and we are the living stones. Zerubbabel is a key for us in this passage of who is going to fulfill the final building of the temple. Do you know what the name Zerubbabel means? Somebody spill it for me. B-E-L. Zerubbabel means the seed out of Babel. How many of you have been called out of Babel? Hebrew for Babylon. Do you know what you are? You are Zerubbabel. He's a spiritual type of who we are in these days. We are the seed who God is going to use to build the final temple in the earth with Yeshua being the cornerstone that the builders rejected. Come on. It's true. And he answered to me, verse 6, and said, This is the word of Jehovah to the seed that came out of Babel. It's not going to be by might that you're going to wake up and come out of her. It's not going to be because you're so smart that you're going to wake up and say, Oh, I shouldn't do Sunday worship anymore. That didn't start with God. I'm going to go back to Sabbath worship. Oh, I shouldn't worship like the pagans. I should worship like the commands of Jehovah because he really meant what he wrote. Well, I think I'll return back to that. Guess what? We're not that smart. We're not that awesome. It's not by our might. It has not been by our power. But it is because the Ruach HaKodesh has written the commands of the Father on our heart. And at the oh. given time, when the Father released the word in all of our lives and all of our journey, He breathed upon us and awakened us to the things of God. Amen. Verse 7. Who are you, great mountain, before Zerubbabel? You're not a mountain. You are a plain. Speak to the mountain. Amen. Exclamation. And he shall bring forth the capstone with shouts of favor, favor to it. The final, last one that's going to come into the living stone temple being built in the earth today. Father knows who it is. And he's speaking favor, favor to those who it is being built with. It is done by his grace alone in our life. And does this not remind you of the Daniel statue that we talked about last Last week of Nebuchadnezzar, where you had the head of Babel, the chest of meat in Persia, 
You had the loins of Greek. You had the two branches of Roman Empire that ends with the ten kings and we are at the toes. There's nothing else unless you want to believe in toe jam left yeah. after the time and the hour that we live in. And how is all of these Gentile nations, Gentile being those outside of the covenant, going to be brought down a stone that has been unhewn by human hands or uncut by human hands is going to come and be hurled at the governmental data, global governing systems of the world, and they are going to crumble. But God's Mount Zion is going to rise. Yes. Verse 8, is that where I'm at? And the word of Yehovah came to me saying, The hands of the one who came out of Babylon have laid the foundations of this house. And they did. These were the returning remnant from Babel itself that came. Most of them stayed in the cushy house of Babel with the markets and the nice couches. But the remnant returned and struggled to rebuild. Come on. It's always the remnant who rebuilds the house of Jehovah. The hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation of this house, and his hands shall complete it. Past prophecy, now prophecy. And you shall know, say no, that Jehovah of hosts has sent me, capital M, has sent Yeshua to you. For who has despised the day of small beginnings? I had to learn to love that verse. Because if you want to build your kingdom or your ministry in this world and promote yourself and sell your stuff and promote and build and network and do it, you're not going to despise the day of small beginnings because you're looking for big. And I looked for big for a long time until God finally killed me enough. And I said, you know what? I think I like small beginnings. I mean, look at this. Ah, Abraham, Sarah, Israel. Small beginnings. One seed of promise. One. Just one. God likes to have really small odds. Or big odds, whatever that would be. So he can get the glory. Don't despise little flock, little pea patch. It's always a remnant. But it's just the beginning. For who has despised the day of small beginnings? They shall rejoice when they see the plumb line in the hand of the seed that came out of Babylon, saying, these are the commandments of Jehovah. Let's do them. Let's walk in them. Let's return to the everlasting covenant. These seven are the eyes of Jehovah, which diligently searched throughout all the earth. Oh, I wish I had time to unpack that phrase. You ought to do a study on the eyes that run to and fro throughout the earth. It is linked to the circular catastrophe judgments of God that have gone on through history and are about to happen again. And I'm not just speaking of Noah's Ark. I'm speaking of times in history like Sodom and Gomorrah. I'm talking of Noah's Ark. I'm talking about the pre-Adamic flood. I'm talking about those times where God has brought catastrophic judgment on the earth. It is amazing when you do your homework how the eyes of God go out and search diligently throughout the earth to mark the righteous and the wicked before the day of judgment. It's amazing. And that's what we're actually going to be getting to in Revelation chapter 11. Verse 11, Then I responded and said to him, What are these two olive trees? And at the right of the lampstand and the other at the left. And I responded a second time and said to him, What are the two olive branches which empty golden oil from themselves by means of the two gold pipes? 
And he answered me and said, Do you not know what these are? And I said, No, my master. And he said, These are the two anointed ones who stand beside the master of all the earth. And we don't have time to unpack that chapter more, but do you mind holding that up? What this chapter talks about are the two olive trees that are the two prophetic witnesses in the earth that minister to the lampstand. Now, I personally believe the reason why there's just one lampstand in this because this is the unified assembly of God in the earth. There is one body, but many members. There's a reason for the two lampstands in Revelation 11, of which we will get to. But several years ago, I think this was, I didn't write the date, we were having Hanukkah at our house, and we had family paint day. And I sat down, and I'd been meditating on this. And the Holy Spirit, I think, helped me paint this because I just don't paint like that good like Steve paints, okay? But these are the two olive trees and the lampstand, and you got the golden bowl and the shoots coming down. But what I want you to see is the ministry that allows this lampstand to burn is that oil that is passed to us through the prophets, through understanding and revelation that we have, we will stand and be a witness and say, I'll tell you what's coming. I tell you what God is doing in the earth today. Oh, for a people that were so bold that we would not be like the ones in Yeshua's day that he chastised. Because he said, you can look at the sky and tell the weather, but you don't know what's happening in your generation. If someone was to come up to you and say, what's God doing? Could you answer them? Can you tell them about the storm of Yehovah from Jeremiah 30 that is happening in the earth right now? It's not just catastrophic weather events. It is the storm of Yehovah. It is the arm of Yehovah being displayed in the earth, bringing and building up into total global judgment of what? Of a global data governance that he did not establish that will try to imprison all those set apart ones and kill some that have been appointed to that. The two olive trees minister, thank you, to the lampstand. To the lampstand. Second paragraph, page three, the two lampstands, when kept in contact with the revelation of who the lampstands are, refer to the assemblies of Yehovah during this 42-month time. And I, just, I know I keep saying that, but I want to keep reiterating that, as that is probably a new thought. And this is the Reformer Study Bible. It's the New King James Version, even though the Reformers used the Geneva Bible. But... Um, an interesting footnote. Um, I got this the other day, and I was just, actually was just praying, because I don't know how God works with you, but a lot of times God will reveal something to me, and like, I have to work really hard and seek Him and do all that, and then finally, boom, and then you turn around and everybody's had it for like 10, 20 years since even Abraham. Somebody's had that revelation, but it's new to me, you know, and I don't know about you, but I like that. Because if God's really revealing something to you, you should not be the only person on the planet with it. He will confirm it through other people. And these people that say, I have the only revelation, I'm just a little spooky with that. I think it will bear witness in our hearts, and I think God will show you other people that have that in the past. And that's why when I was talking about the Glory Dome last week, I talked about why I was so relieved when two other people actually have seen these in the future. That this place of protection and a place of escape that God is going to be providing. But in the footnotes of Revelation 11, in this reflection, former study Bible, you find this sentence of which I will read to you about the two witnesses. I'll just do the whole paragraph. Possibly two literal individual human beings are in view, either two Christian prophets who were martyred shortly before the fall of Jerusalem, or two prophets who will appear shortly before the second coming. But their identification with the two lampstands, verse 4, suggests that they might be symbolic figures, of which I believe they're literal, standing for the witnesses, standing for the witness of the lampstand assemblies. They say churches. 
If this is the case, they would symbolize assemblies rather than specific individuals. I think they got really close with that, but I don't think you have to have either or. I don't think you have to have two prophets or two assemblies because that's not what the text says. You have two olive trees and you have two lampstands in this chapter. Where to go? Let's just end with this today. This will be fun. If I say this will be fun. I wish your face looked like you believe that. Sequentially, all right, in order, in the book of Revelation, I think it's also interesting for context to note where chapter 11 takes place. So we're going to just put that in context and then we'll pick up after this next week. The book of Revelation is written in sequential events, I believe, that happen. In general, you have seven seals, then you have seven trumpets, and then you have seven bowls of wrath, okay? And then there's other stuff in there, but that's the big picture. In between these sevens, you have what they call parenthetical inclusions by John. And that's where it requires the Holy Spirit because he will write something and then all of a sudden he'll change views and he'll expound either on what he just saw or what's coming up. And you have to have the pieces of the puzzle to unlock them from the scripture or you don't really know where you are. And that's why the book of Revelation confuses a lot of people. God has kept it hidden until it's time to be revealed. And so you'll be reading right along your track and yeah, okay, this thing happens. Boom, a third of the earth. Okay, boom, third of the trees. Okay, boom, third of this. Okay, we got all this happening and all of a sudden. And then I was over here on this mountain and Yeshua was playing the harp and you're like, what? happened. And what happened is a big parenthesis just came in and John jumps to some other context that the Holy Spirit knows you're going to need. And so right now just hide it in your heart. Because as these things continue to unpack, things are going to lock. And you're going to understand how this order goes. Chapter 11 is one of these parenthetical pieces in the context of the book of Revelation. Okay, so what is right before this parentheses that John is writing about? Okay, right before this happens, you have the sixth trumpet. How many trumpets are there? If anybody asks you how many are there in the book of Revelation, seven is always a good answer because there's sevens everywhere, okay? But this is right after the seventh trumpet. Let's look at chapter 9 and let's look at verses 13 through 21. This is right after the pit opens, which is a real fun chapter, right? Everybody say, that's the pits. That's it. You got it. Verse 13. And the sixth messenger sounded, and I heard a voice from the four corners of the golden slaughter place, or the golden altar, which is before Elohim, saying to the sixth messenger who had the trumpet, release the four messengers, those having been bound at the great river Euphrates. Where's Euphrates? Turkey, Syria, and Iran. Interesting. All of the world right now is focused on that. That area. Verse 15. And the four messengers, those having been prepared for the hour and the day and the month and the year, were released to kill a third of mankind. And the number of the armies of the horsemen were 200 million, and I heard the number of them. And this is how I saw the horses in the vision, and those who sat on them, having a breastplate of three colors, fiery red, hyacinth blue, and sulfur yellow. And the heads of the horses were like the heads of lions, and out of their mouths came fire, smoke, and sulfur. Why? Because they came out of the pit. And they're breathing hellfire. Verse 18, And a third of mankind was killed by these three plagues, by the fire and the smoke and the sulfur, which came out of their mouths. For the authority of the horses is in their mouth and in their tails. Listen to this. For their tails are like serpents having heads. 
and with them they do harm. And the rest of mankind who were not killed by these plagues repented, got on their face and said, boy, will we wrong save us? They did not repent of the works of their hands. I'm going to worship the way I want to worship. I'm going to live the way I want to live. You're not going to tell me what to do. Psalms 2, I'm going to throw off your bonds and do my own thing. Generation. They did not repent of their own works that they should not worship the demons and the idols of gold and of silver and of brass and of stone and of wood which were which are neither able to see nor hear nor to walk and they did not repent of their what murders if we knew what was going on behind closed doors today around the world nor of their drug sorceries Pharmakia is rooted in the word sorcery. It's using pharmakia drugs to open up portals to spiritual dimensions. Don't do that because when you do, you open yourself up to demonic possession. Do not use drugs to get to the spirit world because you can. But it is illegal and you will get more than you bargained for. Right. And they did not repent of their murders, nor of their drug sorceries, nor of their whoring that is spiritually worshiping foreign gods and sexually, nor of their thefts. So this is the sixth trumpet that we have here. And then this is this chapter 11 then. You have 10, and then you have chapter 11, but then you have the um, seventh trumpet that is actually at the end of chapter 11. So chapter 11 is wedged in between the sixth trumpet, of which I just read to you, where these four angels in the bottom of the Euphrates put there for a day and an hour and a month and a year that God has said to be released. And when they do, they will be a spiritual, supernatural army that will invite the earth and the prophets and the apocrypha call them phanatasia or phanat phanatasium forgot the exact word they used in second Baruch but they will come and they will kill a third of them of mankind who are not obedient in worshiping Jehovah what is a third of mankind interesting statistic you read that and it's like a oh, big deal but in World War one do you know how many people were killed 8.2 million people gave their lives and were killed in war in World War I between 1914 and 1918. In World War II, do you know how many people were killed? Five, yeah, 52 million. What's coming upon is the day of Yehovah. It may proceed, be preceded by World War III, unless they learn how to everybody get along, which is not prophesied. World War III, if the current population, and this is a couple of years old, the guy that broke this down, I wrote the notes in my scripture. I didn't do this math, they did. But in World War III, according to the population of the world about two years ago, a third of the population of man would be 2.2 billion. Ladies and gentlemen of the congregation, this is just one trumpet. Watch and pray. I believe, and you can disagree with me and when Yeshua shows up he'll set us all straight I believe we are currently in the seals judgments and I believe that they are being opened I do not think they are filled and I think that's sometimes why we misjudge if you wanted to do a histogram my big word I just learned in sixth grade math with my daughter which I couldn't use because you have to use quantities of data rather than one piece of data but let me say par bar chart if you had the first seal all right that took off I believe it's taken off but it's not filled up yet 
I personally believe when it says that you have a white horse and a horse with a rider and he's given a bow, we've all been taught it's the Antichrist and he has a crown, but he doesn't have an army. He just goes out to conquer people. Okay, I'll hold that in my pocket. But if you take the word bow and you take it into the Greek, it's the Greek word toxin, which means bow. But if you take it to the root of that word, do you know what it means? It means birth pains. You can do it yourself. I encourage you not to believe me and do it yourself. But if you go to Revelation chapter 6, take the word bow, it's, it's number Greek 5008 toxin. It's the only time it's used in the entire renewed covenant. So we have no other premise to judge it with. But if you go to the Greek root word, which is um, tecto, tecto, T-E-K-T-O. I don't have the number, sorry. But it means to bring forth, to bear, to produce fruit. It is also used to be, to be in travail or birth pains. I believe that the earth has already started to travail and give forth birth pains. I believe we're seeing it naturally. I do believe there are events that have happened, of which I have one particular, but I will not share that. You can tell me yours if you want. But you have birth pains that, that have been popped. Who's in charge of the seals? The Antichrist? Is he the one opening these? Satan's in charge. Is he the one opening? Who's in charge of the seals? Yeshua. So everybody say relax. Yeah. We're just on the roller coaster, but he's got the track laid out, okay? So we've got the first seal that happens, which I believe are birth pains. The second thing, you've got the red horse. Um, we don't have time, again, to go into this. I believe when you look at the sword there, again in the Greek, huge key, the type of sword mentioned is judgmental. It's a judgment, and it's in the context of, like, courts, legal systems. I think it's very interesting in the world that we live in right now, all the the nations across the world are putting laws on their books that make what we believe illegal. Again, I believe the second seal has been popped. I believe that it is mounting. Now here's where it gets fun. Everybody say third seal. Third seal. What color is it? Black. What happens with the black rider? Notice there's a horse and a rider. Have we heard that in scripture before? Interesting. I believe one represents the natural entity and the other the spiritual entity that works through it. But we have the black horse and the rider. The interesting thing about the black horse and the rider is he has a scale in his hand. Scale in his hand. I know this is probably at the wrong end of the scale, but anyway. And what happens? They cry uh, a day's wage for wheat and a day's wait for barley. What's happening in the world that we live in right now? We can't plant corn. China can't plant corn. Australia just had to import corn for the first time in a long time. They're losing crops in Italy. They're losing crops in uh, Europe. They are having trouble. They can't plate the soybeans because it's underwater. I just find it extremely interesting. And then here's what kicked me over with this. Okay? Judge it for yourself. We'll know when it's revealed. The other day, and I know some of you watchers are already on this, but I was just watching what's going on in the world. How do they relate to signs in scripture? I know there's a global data system arising as the beast out of the sea. I know that they're going to force people to be, uh, take a mark to operate in that system. It's going to be monetary in order to purchase things. So we're watching for this, right? Most of you know about blockchain. If you don't, it's the ledger, the digital ledger, ledger that's been built for the internet so that every financial transaction that happens on the internet is kept. It's called blockchain. It's already operating, and they have cryptocurrencies that operate on them. Personally, I think a lot of them have just been thrown out there to test the market. Bitcoin is a big one, and a lot of people have heard of that. But it's volatile, and it really doesn't have any substance to it. 
the other day minding my own business just watching looking saying holy spirit is something going on when I was doing that, I came across a story that Facebook has begun to launch its own cryptocurrency. How many of you heard about that? Okay. What's the name of that cryptocurrency? Libra. Libra. Do you know what the astral sign is for Libra? It is a man holding a scale. Give me a hmm. Mm. One of the biggest global what would you call it? Corporation? Spying technique? No, but corporation that has millions of users already involved in the format, very familiar. The head guy of PayPal one year ago left PayPal and moved to, to uh, Facebook. And everybody was like, why is he going over there? This year, uh, this last week or two weeks ago, they announced the intention to launch their own Facebook cryptocurrency called Libra. It will be in a wallet called Calibra. You don't have to be on Facebook to use the wallet, but you can use it in there. What makes this different from Bitcoin that's volatile and up and down is two things. It's based on uh, national currencies. So you can take a dollar, put it in your Calibra wallet, and it will be converted to an actual crypto that you can then send to your friend and buy whatever you want to buy from them. It also will be govern governmentally over overseen and have oversight. It will be regulated. So this will be governments of the world coming together overseeing a digital dollar or a digital yen or a digital pound. It's also like the IMF, the Unitary Monetary Fund, where it will hold a basket of all the main uh, monies of the world. So you can do international global trading through this. Now the fact that it had the sign of these scales called Libra at the time when wheat and barley and soy and corn harvest in our country. We've got an alarm going off. Imagine that. There's an alarm going off during the sermon. Um, but this is going off right now. And I think it just serves to be awake enough to ask, is this the or is this a step toward that direction? And we've all been watching this guy, Jared Kushner, and trying to figure out, is he the or a guy in this process? And again, I'm just watching, looking out there, and I'm seeing this guy getting up, going to give a peace initiative for the Middle East, all right? Behind him, it says, Peace to Prosperity Workshop. And he announced, many of you probably heard it, giving $50 million to the Palestinians, which sounds very good. They need to help them. If we had not taken away the aid that we had already been given to the Palestinians, they would have more aid right now than this package would even offer them, according to the guy that I heard counter this as a rebuttal. And I encourage you, don't just take everything your government tells you. At least find someone with the other side of the coin and then take it to the Father. And if you can't talk about it without getting angry, you're probably too invested anyway. All right? So... But we've got a guy prancing around the planet right now that's pretty high up that's saying a plan to peace and prosperity. If you know your scriptures, you know that the scripture says when they say what? Peace and prosperity. Peace and safety or peace and prosperity. What are we supposed to be doing? Look up. Why? The aliens are coming? Oh, that's the Navy that says the aliens are coming. Sorry. Because your redemption draweth nigh. It might serve us well this week to pray this, the prayer that we begin with today, Luke 21, and say, Yeshua, you told me to pray this. I think I'll pray this. Let me be found worthy to escape what is coming on this earth and let me be able to stand before the Son of Man. Help me not to be so drunken and mixed into this world and what's going on in it. 
that I'm not awake enough to know as you're hearing shofar sound around the planet because of the cosmic rays that are flooding into our atmosphere, heating up the core. Last week, two volcanic eruptions went up into the stratosphere. Ladies and gentlemen, that's high. 12 miles. 12 miles. Thank you, watcher. But that's not enough from the pressure that's building because the earth is going to birth the messianic age and baby the earth the birth pains are about to increase and we should be sober we should be sober so i believe personally we're in the seals i believe we're possibly here I believe we're leading into a time where there'll be many martyred, which are going to tie into the seven assembly lampstands that we're going to look for. And I believe there will be those witnessing during the time of the trumpet judgments. That sounds amazingly crazy. Yes, it does. But God is able. Father, we give you praise and glory. And we thank you that you told us beforehand so that we could have faith in that day. And Father, I pray, I pray, I pray for me. I can't pray for anybody else in this room because they got to hold on to their own crown. Father, I pray for us in that respect that we would be awakened brides waiting the return of their King, Messiah, bridegroom we would have oil in our lamps we would have them trimmed and ready and Father, as we are literally building an ark on this property right now in the days of Noah and the Noaks are here to prove it we give you praise and glory that we do not have to be unaware, we do not have to be ignorant, and most of all, as you ministered to us in worship today, we never have to fear, because you have always won. We never have to fear, because you are the victorious one. We give you glory and honor. Draw us this week. Let us get in the prophets. Let us read the scriptures. Let us ask questions. Let us wait before you. And we thank you for it. In Yeshua's name, let the righteous set apart little flock of Jehovah say amen. Amen. Go be a witness this week.